everyone this is dominique from drop solid i have the pleasure to introduce this uh, this session uh so last year a dream came true for drop solid um being a diamond sponsor at drupalcom and this year the the dream continues um just like last year we're doing a survey to make our product better um, and if you fill in the survey drop solid will donate 15 minutes of contrib time to Drupal. So we'll be sponsoring a core contributor for 15 minutes for every filled in survey uh, at our boot. Um, so why do we do this? Uh, we want to know if we're on the right track with our product. And what is this product? Uh, it's a digital experience platform with Drupal at its core. It extends Drupal with open tools like Matic, marketing automation, you know me, CDP to deliver AI-driven um, personalization-driven experiences. So it's targeted towards smaller and mid-sized enterprises. Um, it's a cloud platform for developers and marketers. It gives them the freedom to, uh, to build the experiences just the way they want, keeping the control over the code, the content, and the data. So we want to know if we're in the right direction. Uh, come at our boot, fill in our survey, and we'll donate 15 minutes of, uh, of contrib time to a Drupal contributor. So, and now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers of tonight. They're all leaders of the Drupal initiatives. They make sure the new improvements get released into the Drupal core and Drupal.org. Um, they are the driving force behind all the innovations, uh, finding their way into the Drupal ecosystem. So we'll be hearing from uh, Putra Bonacorsi, Ted Bowman, Len Swanfeld, Neil Drum, Ryan Aslett, and Buddy Sonia Breidert, what they're working on and how do uh, and how you can get involved. So um, I'll be giving the word to Gabor, who will be moderating the session hi thank you dominic um it's nice to be here uh, we created this keynote because there's a lot of things going on in drupal and we wanted to have a different set of initiatives showcased at every event where possible so you could look into what happens in drupal core what happens at drupal.org and in other initiatives as part of this initiative keynote and it's also a great opportunity to get to know all of the different initiative leads that are making these things happen. So it's my pleasure to hand this over to Putra Bonacorsi to talk about Olivero. Um, yeah, I actually want to say that I'm so honored to be here today to present the update on the Alvero theme, which is slated to be the new Drupal 9 front end theme. There are there have been a lot of great work that went into this initiative, and I'm excited to quickly walk you all through the genesis of how this team was formed, where we are today, and what to expect in the new year as well. Just a bit about myself. My name is Putra Bonacorsi. I've been in the Drupal community for about eight years now, ever since I was a senior in college. I started my career as a front-end developer, and but now recently transitioned into a technical project manager role at Lullabot. I live in Seoul, New Jersey, USA, and I'm one of the maintainers of the Alvaro theme. Here's a look at the making of the current team members of the Alvaro initiative. We have Mike Hoshel, who is our community coordination and lead front developer, Jared Panchan, and also Jen Bukowski, our lead designers, um, Matthew Tiff, our community coordination, and Katshaw, our accessibility guru, and Constantine, who is also our front end developer as well. We're the team behind the new Drupal 9 front end theme called Alvaro. Um, here are some sneak peek of what the theme looks like. Um, another thing I also would like to know is that this theme was named in honor of Rachel Alvaro, who had touched many people in the, both in the Drupal and also accessibility community as, as well. And I'm happy to um, walk you guys through what we have today. Um, before we look ahead, I just want to quickly walk you all through how we got here today, because every journey, or I should say, um, Drupal Core Initiative has a story, and it's good to reminisce on the early stages of the project. And I only have a short period of the time allocated to this portion of the presentation, so I will try to go as quickly as possible. <laughs> if I had to pinpoint a moment of time where the conversation of the new Drupal 9 theme started, I would have to say the last day of DrupalCon Seattle 2019. I happened to be in the hotel lobby waiting for a friend to meet up for dinner. While waiting, I started to have a conversation with what 
with um, what makes a good CMS team with Mike Hoshua and also um, Larry Escola and Angie Barron, who are the core product managers. And the rest was kind of history. <laughs> Here's a look at the very first issues related to the new Drupal 9 theme that we submitted to the Drupal community. As you can see, um, it was authored on June 28, 2019, which was roughly about a year and a half ago, which is kind of crazy, right? Um, a main motivation for proposing this idea was to create a good first impression for a user, which is typically the first experience that people get when they first install Drupal. Um, as you can see here, here are some screen captures of all the different documentations that we've done throughout the project, um, from meeting notes to meeting with stakeholders as well too. Here are some of the design comp aspiration that our designers, Jared and Jen put together. As you can see, we explored different um, designs from traditional to modern as well too, um, but this is the um, design that we landed today. Obviously, I can't go through all the different steps um, that the team had put together um, within the time frame that we have in this presentation, um, but I highly recommend checking out um, Jared's and also Jen's talk about the design process behind Outrail. Um, some of you might have caught this talk early this morning. However, if you missed the section, um, I do have a talk um, later on in the week on Thursday um, to as a walkthrough of our process and also challenges of this initiative as well. Um, so now let's get to the good part. Where is our Vero theme today and what have we been brewing up in the last year or so? Here's a roadmap issue that we created. Um, we started this journey around the beginning of 2019 and almost a year and a half ago. And I'm happy to announce that the Alvaro theme has now landed in Drupal Core 9.10 as the experimental, experimental theme. Yay. <laughs> um, this is such an incredible milestone and we could have done this without all the ama amazing folks who have contributed to their free time to this initiative from designing to community coordination, submitting patches, review and testing issues, and many more as well too. I couldn't thank you all enough and I hope I capture all the usernames here and I hope I didn't um, miss anyone. Um, another thing I also like to highlight is the alley or accessibility testing with folks from the National Federation of the Blind as well too. And according to the email feedback that we received, um, Alvaro is really well done, low visible, um, accessible, and um, they were really all overall impressed with this as well too. And I just wanna give um, you know, a special shout out to Catchall for coordinate this testing effort with the um, National Federation of the Blind as well. Here's a sped up video demo of the Alvaro theme install in Drupal Core 9.1. The video is a bit jarring um, because I'm just going through all the, the key features fairly quickly, um, but this just gives you like a good um, indication of the different features that are available in this new front end theme, such as the drop down menu and everything else as well. Um, now that you've seen a sneak peek of what the theme has offered, I highly recommend checking out this short link that houses indicative content of what the Alvaro theme looks like um, when you enable in your Drupal installation. Um, special thank you to Tuggle for hosting this preview. It's definitely helpful to have a designated preview environment for all the work that we that went into the theme itself. Um, now that the Alvaro theme has been included into core, I'd like to give you all an update on things that we're currently working on, as well as enhancements that we're looking to implement in the future. Right now, we're working hard on making Alvaro a stable theme within core. We've already outlined the remaining issues to get us to the stage where Alvaro can be set as the default theme of Drupal 9. And I think we're close to meeting this goal. Right now, the majority of our issues are mostly related to code quality, um, adjusting technical debt, and also, um, you know, just general bug fixes as well too. Um, if we stay on track, I think we're looking to um, get this into um, Drupal 9.2. Um, and also looking ahead as well too, we're definitely excited to dive into some of the features that we weren't able to um, tackle during the MVP phase of the initiative. One of which is the dark mode, which is the most highly requested features um, that we've seen so far. Um, and uh, we definitely want to expose um, different accent color options as well too within the theme. And we're looking to um, get into um, that feature into um, Drupal 10 as well too, in addition to other possibilities as well. Um, 
this is end of our slide. Um, I highly encourage you all to join us and help contribute to the theme. It's still ongoing and we're still in the path of trying to get the theme stable. So um, we have a weekly um, Slack meeting every Monday um, at 10 o'clock Eastern time. If you can join us, please um, join us um, and help us get to the finish line. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think you muted. Yeah, thank you, Patra. <laughs> um, I'm really excited for Olivero. I've been um, helping um, around where I can. It's been really amazing to see the team achieve so much um, in such a short time frame. Um, so next up is Ted Bowman, and he's going to talk about all the uh, Thanks, Gabor. <clears throat> Yeah, so as Gabor said, I'm here to talk about Automatic Updates Initiative. It's an existing initiative that many sites have already benefiting from. And we just recently started to work on providing updates within Drupal Core itself. And we have a lot of work going on within Drupal Core and with other inside other independent projects. I am in the wrong browser window. Uh, my name is Ted Bowman. I'm Ted Bow on Drupal.org and Twitter. As part of my work at Aquia's Drupal Acceleration team, I'm working on this initiative since the summer. I'm really excited to be working on this. I'm also the co-maintainer of the Layout Builder and the Settings Tray module in Drupal Core. Um, so here are some of the people that have, I've had the pleasure with working on this initiative. Um, watching Putro's slide, I realized I forgot to put their names on it. So sorry for that. Um, but <laughs> This just encourages you to come by our Drupal Slack and auto updates and come put uh, names to faces. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you would like to help get involved with this initiative, we could always use more help. We need help in many different areas, such as non-Drupal PHP, Drupal backend knowledge, Python, and composer expertise. And finally, we want the end user experience to be as simple and as understandable as possible. So we'll be needing help on the user experience side too. So let's look at an example of a recent security release to see why automatic updates is needed. On September uh, 16th, three security releases were published for three different minor versions of Drupal. These releases covered multiple security vulnerabilities, mostly categorized as moderately critical, but one that was critical. After a month, after the security, a month after the security release, about 45% or over 100,000 sites still not had, had not been updated and were still potentially votable. This real world example shows that even with all the work we do to get people to update their sites, many still don't. Well, the situation is um, needs fixing. There's some caveats to this information. For example, this only includes sites that have the update module enabled. But the truth is now many people expect auto updates. For example, WordPress has provided automatic updates for about half a decade now. And Drupal is a great backend for decoupled sites, but has to compete against software as a service offerings like Contentful, where the user never has to think about updating. With Drupal, you always have to have staff ready for security updates. The first phase of this initiative was sponsored by the European Commission and produced a contrib module that can provide updates for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 sites. The module works with non-composer-based sites and also displays critical security advisories from Drupal.org. The current goal of the initiative is to provide Drupal core security and patch level updates from within, within Drupal core itself via Composer. We want to support truly unattended updates and to provide updates in a safe manner. Hopefully for some sites, this means not having to worry about updates for six months or more. The first thing we'd like to land in core is displaying highly critical security advisories. This type of security advisory happens very rarely, maybe one a year or one every few years, but when they do happen, we want sites to respond very quickly. Hopefully this will be released in Drupal 9.2.0. Of course, no matter how great the eventual automatic update functionality is, it will do you no good if your site is not ready to apply the updates. We're working on update readiness checker system that will provide checks, such as ensuring that your file permissions will allow the update. The API will also allow custom readiness checkers, for example, for hosting specific checks. 
We're also working on the PHP Tough Library, an implementation of the update framework or Tough specification, a flexible framework and specification that can be used by any software update system. We're working with Joomla and Typo3 projects in order to create a library that can be used across multiple PHP CMSs. On the Drupal.org site, work is ongoing to use existing Python Tough Library to securely sign the updates for Drupal Core. By relying on the existing Tough specification, we're taking advantage of the wide open source community to ensure that Drupal's automatic updates are as secure as possible. We've also been involved with improvements to the new version of Composer. Composer's two memory usage improvements will allow running uh, <clears throat> Composer during the web request to implement auto updates. We also help with a feature in Composer 2 that will allow the PHP Tough Library to verify update signatures before they are used. In addition, we're working on a custom Composer command that will allow Drupal to run the complete Composer update in a temporary directory before it is actually applied to the Drupal site. This will allow running some very basic tests against the new update before it is actually applied to the site. Of course, besides all this backend development, we're working on a new automatic update feature in Drupal. It must be understandable within the Drupal admin interface. We're currently reviewing the UX of the existing contrib module from phase one of the initiative and working with the Drupal UX team as we work on new user facing features. There are many hard problems that await us to make automatic updates a reality. Could we move beyond patch updates and provide minor updates automatically too? How should database updates, which are very difficult to recover from if something goes wrong, be canceled, handled? Will Composer 2 memory improvements be enough to allow updating on lower priced hosting? We invite you all to connect with us while, while we're here at DrupalCon. I'll be co-presenting a more in-depth session on Wednesday, which will be immediately followed by a BOF where we can have more in-depth discussion. On Friday, we'll also be holding a contribution day for anyone who wants to get involved. And to keep in touch after DrupalCon, join us on Drupal Slack on the auto updates channel. Come by and say hi whenever, but also we hold bi-weekly Slack meetings on Tuesday at 1900 UTC. And you can find our Drupal core issues tagged with automatic updates initiative or check out the PHP tough repo on GitHub. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. Um, um, this is uh, really great to see automated updates shaping up. I think we've been hoping for a long time that that's going to happen. So I'm really, uh, I'm really excited for seeing automated updates happen. Uh, next up is somewhat of an unusual turn for the Drupal Initiatives keynote, but we uh, looked at all of the tooling changes that have been happening and they are pretty critical for how we build Drupal itself. So it was very important, I think, to um, to cover those as well. So next up is Nil Drum about merge requests on Drupal.org. Hi. So uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about issue forks and merge requests. I'm Neil Drum. I work for the Drupal Association on the engineering team. So uh, I'm one of the people who gets to build Drupal.org itself. And uh, my main project has been merge requests uh, in the last year. Uh, so the reason we're doing this a uh, little di bit differently than GitHub or GitLab.com is that issues on Drupal.org tend to be uh, collaborative. Uh, 5.6 people uh, on average worked on uh, a core issue in the last year that, uh, that's that been fixed. Uh, so we wanted to uh, allow people to collaborate uh, with merge requests. Uh, go through a few definitions real quick. Uh, issue, that's the discussion uh, for improvement on Drupal.org. Fork, that's the repository. Uh, and merge request is the uh, um, place to review that. Uh, so now uh, Drupal.org issue pages all have issue forks uh, enabled. Uh, you see a create issue fork button. Uh, it's good to work in a branch. So there is a branch that will be created by default uh, unless you don't want it or want to change the name of it. And then anyone uh, has the opportunity to push to that issue fork repository, uh, just click get push access and 
uh, then you will have access. Uh, and you can use uh, command line git. Uh, we have some helpers in the UI, uh, click show commands, and that will set, uh, tell you how to set up your git remotes and uh, help you remember all of that, uh, easy, um, all of the uh, git syntax. Uh, or if you have a straightforward change, uh, GitLab has a web IDE, so you can make changes right on the web. Uh, and commit those, and uh, those will be show up as regular commits. Once you're ready for initial review, uh, you can open the merge request. Uh, there's also a button on the issue page for that uh, that will set up uh, the merge request quickly and uh, have it targeted at the branch uh, matching the issue. And once the merge request is open, of course, uh, Drupal CI testing will start uh, as long as the project has tests. Uh, that tests the merge commit uh, that will be made, uh, including the upstream changes as well. Uh, and GitLab, uh, one of the big wins here is it uh, gives us a good place to uh, review changes on uh, lines, specific lines of code, uh, their threaded comments in GitLab, and uh, can also keep track of when they're resolved. Uh, there's a, uh, so this uh, one, if you can see it, uh, was resolved by uh, someone making a uh, change elsewhere and then marking this as resolved. You can also make suggestions for, for specific changes. Uh, so if you see something quick that uh, you can, uh, just do over the web without testing too much, uh, or at least uh, drafting a change, uh, that functionality is there. And one of the things we want to preserve was uh, if you go to a drupal.org issue page, uh, that's all of the activity for an issue. Uh, it's a big list of everything that's happened in chronological order. So all of the merge request activity is brought into there as well. So you can uh, uh, catch up on uh, where you left off when you revisit an issue. Uh, and there's less workarounds that makes it easier to, uh, making it easier to collaborate on drupal.org. You don't need browser extensions. Uh, there's diffs for every commit, so you don't need to uh, create inner diff files uh, all of the tools are in GitLab uh, and integrated with the Drupal.org issue page. And keeping uh, keeping up with upstream changes is easier. Uh, GitLab has a re rebase functionality if you'd like to rebase, or uh, you can merge in the uh, upstream changes. Uh, and you really only need to do this if some something causes a merge conflict uh, with an upstream commit. Uh, you know, since it's Git, the uh, changes will apply. Uh, and if you're the maintainer of a project, uh, the credit and committing field set at the very bottom of the issue page now has a widget to pick uh, which merge requests to merge in, uh, and uh, it will use the commit message with credit uh, drafted uh, by our crediting widget. So I uh, pulled these stats last week, uh, but uh, and th this has been launched for about a month. And so far over a thousand merge requests have been opened, uh, 90, over 90 of them for Drupal core uh, and over 420 of them have been merged. So it's getting great use. Uh, next steps, uh, we're finding cleaning up any uh, issues as we find them. Uh, so yeah, please file an issue if you notice something that looks off or uh, could be improved. And the big kind of medium term priority will be uh, GitLab CI. Uh, we uh, will probably still use uh, the core of Drupal CI, what actually runs the tests, uh, but the uh, dispatcher.drupalci 
ci.org. If you've seen that, it's a Jenkins instance that uh, we would not mind replacing if GitLab CI meets the functionality needs. And it's all possible thanks to uh, the Drupal Association. Uh, that's, that's where I work. And um, yeah, please support us uh, with membership or partnership or otherwise uh, if you can. And uh, we'll keep improving Drupal.org. Uh, a couple of URLs, uh, get.drupalcode.org slash issue. That is all of the issue forks. And there uh, are links to some of the documentation and uh, issues there and drupal.org slash association if you'd like to support us. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Um, when you said there's no no need for pet for interdiffs anymore and we can do code reviews uh, in line with our browser extensions, I was like jumping around. Like, Yay! I think it's a lot of win there. Um, it's a lot of uh, extra that we don't need to teach people and there's a lot of extra that we don't need to do. Uh, to get changes in. So um, it's really going to be beneficial. Uh, thank you. Uh, so next up would be Ryan as to talk about Composer 2. But unfortunately, he um, had, uh, had a health issue today. He's unable to join us. So Tim Lennon is jumping in in his place. He's going to talk us through all the benefits of Composer 2 and what it took to get us there. Awesome for um, letting me join here. And I'm very pleased to be representing the Drupal Association team, to be representing Ryan, who, as Gabor said, couldn't be here right now, and the other people who have worked on Composer, Mile23, Greg Anderson, and others um, who've been collaborating in the Drupal Slack and elsewhere on Drupal.org. So as you know, um, Composer uh, is a major part of developing Drupal sites in the modern era, um, and uh, it has had its trials and tribulations, its concerns with performance, its concerns with uh, memory usage and whether or not uh, it affects uh, what we can do on shared hosting environments and things like that. So um, with the advent of Composer 2 being released on October 28th, um, we made some really significant changes. And the primary value around this came in the form of performance improvements in Composer 2. So you're gonna see significant um, reductions in memory usage if you haven't tried using Composer 2 yet compared to uh, Composer 1 and significant increased speeds in execution time. And I'll talk about um, some of those numbers and then their impact on other initiatives. So memory usage. Um, in Composer 1, the peak memory usage for starting a project was about 200 megabytes. And once you threw in a few modules to, to actually make a, a site that a real person would use, you could get up to like a, a gigabyte plus of memory usage just to run the the standard uh, composer require commands. Uh, in composer two, that's been re reduced by basically 95% in both cases. So now um, you have less than 50 megabytes of memory usage um, when requiring modules into a composer project, which is going to have a significant impact um, in folks working on small shared hosting environments, in people um, working with less powerful hardware in different parts of the world. Uh, and in just getting our work done faster, um, uh, where whoever we are. Um, execution time was slow. This adorable donkey um, is not a very fast animal. Um, the time to start a new project could be you know, a minute and a half, enough time for you to wonder if things are really working. And again, once you require a few modules, you're often sort of sitting and waiting for up to five minutes at a time um, in between being able to then make another change um, in your uh, composer execution, which just, um, constantly interrupts that development process. So after these changes, we're more like a thoroughbred racehorse. Composer 2 can now get a new project started in 20 seconds or so, and additional module requirements, again, still in that sort of 20 second range. Um, so this, again, will extremely quickly accelerate um, what it takes to get up and running with Composer. It'll reduce the frustration of new users to Composer, and will hopefully enable some of these um, other kinds of initiatives and things that we're talking about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about packages.drupal.org because this is the um, what we call the composer facade, the endpoint for composer that we host um, at the Drupal Association on drupal.org um, as a way of presenting all of the metadata that composer requires in order to use Drupal projects. So um, critically, um, because of Composer 2's uh, updates to the metadata format, we're able to shrink down uh, the metadata files. So um, an average 
um, metadata set um, for a composer run it used to be 20 megabytes. It would include like every composer package metadata dependency. It's now down to two and a half megabytes. Um, that's part of what's making this so much faster um, and easier to use. In addition, there are fewer metadata files included, um, uh, both from the Composer 2 development team side and our side, we were able to eliminate the number of metadata files that are being generated at the Composer endpoint uh, because Composer is now smarter about knowing um, what metadata it needs to resolve the dependency calculation for any given site. Um, it can restrict to just what's there. So those overall reductions in metadata are basically 98% uh, less volume of data being downloaded and processed in the metadata um, dependency, um, which again, just a, a great speed improvement and a great um, uh, kind of overall improvement in performance um, for working on these Drupal sites. Um, in addition, there's significantly improved cacheability. So um, the, uh, uh, the dev versions and the stable versions uh, uh, of uh, any given modules packages to data, composer data, is now separated. So we can cache that data until the next release. Um, it used to be that we were regenerating all of the metadata basically every time there was a commit on a, on a repo on Drupal.org. So this is saving us some, some resources in maintaining the, the facade and also allows us to keep it in our CDN longer, which hopefully means dependency resolution is faster wherever you are in the world. Um, we also implemented several changes to Drupal.org specifically um, to uh, in the process of taking advantage of what happens in Composer 2 um, and um, uh, adding some features and capabilities that we think will be useful to be used and extended uh, in other places. So um, one thing that you may have noticed before is that um, if you were updating, uh, making an update to some submodule, maybe something in the, like a submodule of a commerce ecosystem, for example, or something else, um, we, it used to be the case that you would often get stuck on um, a pinned version, like some sub package or sub dependency might be stuck uh, pinned to an exact version and you would have to manually go in and require an, a, a different version or stability version. So now instead of requiring a certain uh, version in the metadata, it goes to like any matching major versions um, for submodule resolution, which can help that a lot. Uh, similarly, uh, we now have more data to understand ecosystem dependencies. So we are logging and tracking whether any particular package is a core package, a contrib package that is the primary module in an ecosystem or the submodules, um, whether dependencies are internal dependencies to Drupal or external dependencies to Drupal. So what we can do with this is we can start to understand, for example, how much of the Drupal ecosystem depends on third-party libraries, how much can even be used without Composer anymore, um, and what else could we really do um, to figure out um, what's most used in the, in the Composer ecosystem. Are there third-party dependencies that are becoming crucial and critical to what a variety of modules in the ecosystem are using? And should we therefore look to supporting those third-party dependencies or at least paying attention to them to ensure that um, they continue to support everything that we do in Contrib? We could also do some interesting things. This is a quick mock-up. We could store some of the calculated dependencies on releases. Uh, for software. So we could uh, provide some more information to developers to say, hey, um, if you use this module, here are some of the dependencies that are going to be installed. Um, and that just may provide development teams a little bit more useful information to um, understand what's going to wind up in the final recipe once they uh, require a certain uh, module using Composer. Um, another part of the initiative of better utilizing Composer in the Drupal world uh, is related to Drupal core, right? So um, we've made some changes to help make sure that core is compatible with using Composer 2 in your workflows and to just improve some bugs and, and things that we wanted to iron out uh, in the way the default core Composer scaffolding was set up. Um, so the main thing that needed to happen is, uh, you know, scaffolding a site uh, in Drupal core with Composer requires a number of different plugins in the ecosystem. There's the core vendor hardening plugin for security. Uh, project message, the Composer scaffold, Composer installers, those plugins all needed to be updated to the Composer 2 compatible API to make sure that you could build these sites uh, using Composer 2. Um, so that's uh, been a critical part. 
Uh, we also updated the way the default stability flags work. So if you're familiar with Composer, you know that you can say, um, uh, I want to only use stable modules by default, or I'm willing to use dev modules by default. Or you can take an individual package and say, this one, it's OK if I want to use release candidates or alpha versions even. You can set up these different kinds of stability flags. Um, so uh, right now, um, you need to be explicit when you're choosing unstable modules to help avoid non-stable um, uh, code being included in your code base and to help encourage our maintainers to say, hey, this, this needs a release. It's time to take that RC and actually move it to a, to a stable version. Um, there's also significant improvements uh, to what we could do with the update manager and potentially the automated updates initiative. So because these performance improvements are so great, it may actually be reasonable to run uh, composer processes uh, in hosting environments. And this is not something that you would see in a, like an enterprise environment where you're using the normal dev staging prod workflows, but it is something you might see for the smaller end of the site spectrum where people are working in a single space on a shared hosting environment. Um, we might also be able to use this to create a inbuilt module installer um, that can handle things like composer dependency resolution and things, things of that nature as well. Um, so if you're out there and you're maintaining a site and you've been doing it on Composer 1 and maybe been getting a little frustrated with how it performs, um, you can convert your site to start working in Composer 2. It's actually usually a pretty easy process. This documentation page will tell you how to do that, how to start working uh, in Composer 2 with any existing site you might have. And typically, it's very easy unless you're using any other custom Composer plugins, um, in which case you may need to update them to Composer 2 compatible versions. Um, so in addition to that, um, uh, I just want to say that as we further understand how Composer is used in the ecosystem, we do want to see how this can be used to support uh, automated updates, modules and in module installers, or really sort of any other kind of feature that involves the automation of dependency resolution and update information for your Drupal sites. Um, so with that, I think I'll hand it back over to Gabor. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, it's been, you did a great job jumping in. I think you woke up an hour ago and learned that you need to jump in. Uh, so uh, great job, Ryan, uh, to, present, to prepare the content and Tim to deliver it, I think. Uh, I also wrote a blog post about Composer 2. I tested it, and I was I was blown away. I, I couldn't even imagine that this kind of uh, generational improvement is possible. So if you're not yet using uh, Composer 2, or if you've been uh, afraid or concerned about Composer before, uh, Composer 2 is the best chance uh, to get started with that. And um, next up is Betty herself, and she's going to cover uh, the Decoupled Menus initiative. Hello. Thank you, Gabor. Um, so we are a new initiative, and um, therefore we don't have so much to talk about. And in the case of like, we can't show too much, but there's maybe going to be a little teaser. Uh, but what we definitely are doing at the moment, we have been forming, and uh, and we now finally have a team set up, and, uh, and we are also looking for more people. So I'm going to go through a little bit what we are doing. So I'm Patti, I'm located in Frankfurt, and I am in within the initiative, I'm an onboarding and communications lead. It means that um, if you want to join or if you want to participate, uh, then I can help you to get onboarded so you understand what we're doing and uh, and figure out like how you can be part of the initiative. Um, we have two initiative coordinators. Uh, one is uh, Not uh, Theodore from France. And then we have Gabe. Uh, he's located in the US. And uh, he's also, or both of them have been participating in a lot of uh, work until now. And, and they are now continuing here. We also have two other roles. Um, we have Liam, who is the meetings and issues secretary. So Liam and myself, we like do a little bit of the project management in the initiative. And then we have Asutosh, who is the weekly meeting lead in the Asia and Australia time zone. And he's located in India, and Liam is located in LA in the USA. And I think he's already joining here today. I've at least seen him in the chat. So hi, Liam. <laughs> we have, of course, many others. And I'm just like mentioning here a couple of those who have been very active in the chat and in the issue queue. 
uh, recently. Um, so we also, like I said, there's the one, it's you, you know, we are looking for more people to help out and we are looking for uh, all kinds of roles. Um, but at the moment, uh, this, these are the people who have been creating and grooming issues for the initiative and creating the roadmap. So the background is coming from DrupalCon Global. Uh, Dries Note, in the Dries Note, Dries uh, announced this initiative. And the mission was actually to provide the best way for JavaScript frontends to consume configurable menu, menus managed in Drupal. And, um, and we have basically been taking this uh, mission and been trying to like create a roadmap. And in the beginning, you might think that it would be a small step to do, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that we need to figure out. And uh, this is just part of it. And I actually, we are not going to go into any details like they have been doing maybe here before, because I think Teresa is going to be giving some details on this tomorrow together with uh, some of the people in the team. How does this work? So when there is an initiative, then there is a core idea issue created. So you can go and look at this issue. There the idea has been put together. So the background of the initiative and the idea and who is going to be a, co you know, like a coordinator in the initiative and participating. And we basically need to agree on this. So there have been a couple of meetings happening and there's been a lot of discussions on Slack. And then finally, this is going to, when this is approved, then uh, we created a project. And in this project, this is just a, a normal Drupal.org project, we actually start uh, grooming our issues. It means that if you're interested in participating in this, is, in this initiative, you basically go into this project and you start to look at the issues there. Um, there we also have information about our roadmap. We have information about like what we are doing currently and we try to document everything there that happens on Slack. Um, Mentioning Slack, here's just a little screenshot of how does that happen? Well, we have a lot of people in different time zones, so it's difficult to have a meeting in certain times, um, but we have a Slack channel. And currently we, or when I did this, we had 146 members. I think we have even more now um, that are participating. And I really encourage you, if you are one of those 146, please join and say hi and, and tell us a little bit about you, what, uh, what you are interested in because uh, we will need a lot of help in, in the next couple of months as well. So it's the decoupled menus initiative. We also have a meeting uh, twice uh, every week. So one happens at two o'clock UTC on Tuesdays. That happened just earlier, one, two, year, two hours ago, I think. And then we repeat that meeting at four o'clock UTC, 12 hours or around about 12, 13 hours uh, later. I think it is four o'clock. Um, so therefore, please join this meeting. So how can you help? And this is actually what uh, we wanted to just focus on today. We wanted to show you a couple of issues so you can actually see how you can help. If you are interested in like JSON API or if you're using that. So what we are currently trying to, under uh, trying to decide on is the API response format for menu data. So there are many different ways how you can do that. And we have, there are already different ideas in this issue. Uh, so please, if you have an idea, if you have been doing this in your projects, please come and help us to figure this out so we can actually agree on a, a response. Uh, we also have a, we have two issues. This is the first issue about the proof of concept demo. And I think like uh, a little teaser, I think that there's gonna be something shown in the <laughs> three snow tomorrow, but, uh, one has been created by Gabe and there is actually, you can set this up yourself and there has been like, you know, discussions about like what React uh, components can we use or what do you, wait, uh, Vue.js components can we use? So to try this out. So there is a proof of concept out there. So you can comment and actually start to set this up. And then uh, Stuart, he has been putting up this Drugs.js demo which has a little bit of a different approach of how to accomplish the same thing. And he has also put down uh, information about how you can try out this demo and how you can look at how that works. So in both cases, we, we are also looking for more demos if you, you know, have ideas how to do it and if you're interested in it. So if you have any idea or if you want to work on those, please come into the issue queue and create an issue for it. 
So we are also looking for people that are going to figure out like technical documentation and um, there's actually, we don't have any way to document the, the API that exists in Drupal core at the moment. So, you know, we are going to be discussing, you know, or produce a sample open API schema and not has been leading this or Theodore. So there are more issues in this area. So if you are interested in this or have you, if you have been doing it in some of your projects, then please come and help us figure that out. There is also a new issue that I was put in just a couple of days ago about creating mock JSON API server for development environment. So again here, um, there are already some discussions that have been taking place both in our Slack meetings uh, and we try to put that all into this issue. So if you, if you have a good idea how to do this, then please uh, go and check out this issue. Um, maybe a, you know, another way of, of doing it. So we want our JavaScript um, developers that start to use Drupal, that we want to have it really easy for them, that how, how they actually should connect to, to the APIs. So we want to have an end user friendly technical documentation. So if you are interested in helping uh, how to document this as well as creating FAQs. So one of the biggest challenges in, in initiatives like this is like to figure out what, what is it actually that we are going to try to do. So, and what is a decoupled menu and why are we doing it with menus and, and what are we actually doing? So we are trying to put this together in an FAQ. Uh, so we have put that together and that's going to result in a documentation page on Drupal.org. We are going to be uh, having two buffs happening. There's going to be one tomorrow morning UTC, and then there's going to be one on Thursday in the afternoon for those who are in the US and that area. We are also going to be featured in the Note tomorrow, so don't forget to come to that one. And on Friday uh, in the contribution day. And again, we are on the Slack channel Decoupled Menus Initiative. And I've said the word initiative plenty of times now and I now I think I have figured out how you actually write the name. <laughs> so how many eyes are actually in this word and who is also sharing that with me that you you know it's such a difficult word. But um, thank you for today. <laughs> yeah thank you. I totally agree. I'm the I'm an initiative coordinator coordinator and I have the problem of not being able to type initiative uh, still to this day. I've been doing it for I don't know 10 plus years. Still a problem. Uh, so thank you, Betty. Um, it's uh, I think it's great to see an initiative at this stage where you can jump in and make a difference in whatever area you want to. It's not like here we did this magic thing and enjoy, but you have the chance to be involved and to and to contribute and to make a change and to and to form it in the way that you want it to be. So I think it's really exciting. Um, to see like that. And next up is actually myself. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to talk about um, the Drupal 10 initiative. Um, and that's an initiative that I'm leading, um, or I'm, I'm an initiative coordinator for, rather. Um, so let's talk about that. So uh, the Drupal 10 initiative <clears throat> Um, um, is an interesting one. I'm uh, leading it as a Drupal Initiative Coordinator coordinator. I've been a core contributor since 2003 and a core committer since 2007. You can find me at, at Gabor Hoichi. I've also been the Initiative Coordinator for Drupal 9, and I guess we are bringing uh, forward the experience from there. And you may think, why Drupal 10 already? We just released Drupal 9 in June, and yes, that's true. So we released Drupal 9 in June uh, because Symphony 3 end of life is at the end of next year. And we wanted to have Drupal 9 available in time for you to use before uh, Symphony 3's end of life, uh, which is included in Drupal 8. So there's very similar thinking behind Drupal 10's timeline, except that it involves Symphony 4 and CK Editor 4 as well, as well as some other dependencies. So both of those dependencies are end of life at the end of 2000. 23. So we think that we'd like to make Drupal 10 available in June or August or December of 2022 um, as soon as uh, it is possible, basically. 
So Drupal 9, I think, uh, brought very little disruption, at least as compared to Drupal 7 to 8. So I'm not concerned that Drupal 10 is going to be here again uh, two years after Drupal 9. And I think uh, the uh, shorter timeline of Drupal 10 would also mean that there's going to be even less of a disruption. So that's what I expect. We've also built a lot of tools to help with this uh, process. We built upgrade status that helps you check your environment, your projects, your um, you, it, it guides you to contribute to different uh, projects. So when there's uh, updates available that make it available to make your site Drupal 9 compatible, it informs you about that. There's no updates, then it informs you about how to collaborate with the community. So it's been really useful to get sites ready and we get a lot of good feedback uh, for this tool. So we hope to continue using this tool and build even more tools to help you move forward seamlessly from Drupal 9 to Drupal 10 as well and use all of the experience we've had so far. And Drupal 10 is again built in Drupal 9 the same way we built Drupal 9 and Drupal 8. So Drupal 10 should include uh, hopefully Claro as the default admin theme, Olivero as the default front end theme, uh, better media, first class layout builder, and even better decoupled experiences as you've seen in the previous initiatives. So those should all be included in Drupal 10 and those are uh, nice and shiny new things, but Drupal 10, the Drupal 10 initiative is more about the boring internal things. And I say boring because these are more uh, internal technical updates to uh, projects that we depend on. They don't necessarily mean that they don't have any other benefits. They may as well have other user benefits, but these are a lot of internal technical updates that we need to make. So first thing that we already did is PHP 8 support. Uh, Drupal 9 supports PHP 7.3 plus, and uh, for Drupal 10, we've implemented PHP 8 support, and that's already available in Drupal 9.1 that was released last week. So you can already enjoy uh, using that with PHP 8. Uh, as uh, Tim covered, we already implemented Composer 2 support. That's actually backported to Drupal 9 and also back, uh, backported to Drupal 8. Um, so it's available um, on all of those versions. So all of the benefits of Composer 2 are now available, but this is a forward-looking uh, update that we will also need with um, Drupal 10. And then we are working on the Sym on a Symfony update because Drupal 9 depends on Symfony 4.4, and we need to update to either Symfony 5.4 or even Symfony 6 in Drupal 10. And we've implemented and released uh, theoretical compatibility with uh, Symfony 5.0 and Drupal 9.1. Uh, but we still need to keep following the new Symfony releases and make these updates available. So this is a work in progress. This is a toolbox image representing that. Uh, we need more help in this area. We uh, keep finding uh, things that we need to work on to make Drupal 9 compatible with Symfony 5.2 that was released recently. And we'll keep following Symfony releases and we'll see if we can be on Symfony 5.4 or 6 when the time comes. So we are pretty good in terms of backend, but the more interesting things are on the front end. So if you're a front end developer, we need you to be involved. So the biggest change that we need to make is CK Editor 4 to CK Editor 5. It's kind of similar to Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. It's a whole new object model for CK Editor 5, which is really good for us. It's supporting collaborative editing and a bunch of other things, but it's a whole new API for CK Editor. They changed how plugins work. There's a migration involved that we need to take care of. So this is an area where we need the CK Editor team to be involved to implement some things that are currently missing from CK Editor itself. And there's also a lot of work on the Drupal part that we need to do to be compatible with CK Editor 5. So this we are, are going to implement in Drupal 9. Um, and we want to release it um, around the end of next year in Drupal 9 but we need a lot of help in this area uh, to make this happen. So that's the issue uh, where you can be involved in the Drupal core uh, fork that we have there. Uh, we are also removing all of the jQuery UI components that are left in Drupal 9. There were some removed uh, from the process from 8 to 9, but there's dialog, uh, autocomplete, uh, drop button, et cetera, that are still left. So we are working on removing those and replacing with other libraries. Unfortunately, jQuery UI is uh, end of life, so we need to move on from there. We are also moving on from jQuery, and we hope to replace uh, most of jQuery, all of jQuery, with uh, pure JavaScript 
so that's the issue where you can look at. There's a bunch of other um, components like uh, our tour a jQuery Joyride system that we hope to replace as well. So all of these need more people involved. So if you have front-end experience, if you'd like to uh, help move uh, Drupal over to the modern JavaScript space, then this is your time. Uh, finally, we also uh, hope to improve the theming experience in Drupal core. So now when you build a theme, you inherit, uh, you do runtime inheritance from a Drupal core theme like Classy. And then it's great because uh, you don't need to copy all that code. But now it's not so great for Drupal core developers because we cannot fix bugs in Classy because that would break your theme. So what we hope to do uh, from Drupal 10 onwards is to provide a starter kit theme that you fork for your own theme. And then we can fix the starter kit theme because new sites would uh, create new forks of the theme. Old sites would maintain the old forks of the theme. And then we hope to provide tools to apply the fixes to the forks so that you can take advantage of the bug fixes as we go along on your own pace. So this is, uh, this is quite a big um, undertaking. And it would allow us to bring forward our theming system and fix CSS and front end issues much faster than currently. This is unfortunately not really moving much uh, since DrupalCon Global, where Laurie Escola had a great session about this topic. So I hope that um, we can find enthusiastic people to uh, take this on. So these are all the main things that we hope to achieve in the Drupal 10 initiative. And package all of these packaged up as um, if we are successful building them will form uh, Drupal 10 with all the other improvements that come from the other initiatives. So if you are interested in more details, you're welcome on the Drupal 10 initiative. Here we go session at 1515 UTC on Thursday. Uh, it's gonna be presented by myself. And of course we are on Slack as well. So we welcome you on the D10 readiness channel on Drupal Slack. And we have meetings every other Monday at 7 p.m. UTC. We just had our meeting um, yesterday. So our next meeting will be uh, briefly before Christmas and then in the new year. So hope to see you there, uh, especially if you are, want to be involved in front end changes. And that was the Drupal 10 initiative. So finally, um, I'm going to introduce Len, who's going to cover the Buck Smash initiative, which I think uh, is really exciting. Um, and yeah, I'd like to take it, I'd like to hand it over to Len now. Okay. Well, here we go. Um, so I'm Len, I'm Len Dude on Drupal.org, and I'm going to talk a little about the Bug Smash initiative, which is about cleaning up the issue queue for Drupal Core and mostly about the bugs in the issue queue. Um, so uh, it's a community initiative. Um, and we're all about addressing bugs in Drupal 8 core. And I say addressing fairly specifically and not fixing, uh, because there is a lot more involved in fixing a bug in core than just getting the fix done. Um, so we're all about the process of getting, working towards fixes. So nudging bugs in the right direction. Uh, why did we do this? We wanted to lower the time that bugs are open. Uh, open bugs are a huge drain on community uh, assets and that the time that you spend on applying patches to your projects much better spent on the initiatives that we talked about today. Um, so we want to lower that time so that you don't have to reply everything and we want to stop people from having the feeling that their bugs are ignored because they're open so long. Uh, and there was also the thing that they really wanted an initiative in the Australian times. Um, Core has quite a lot of bugs as you can see. There's over 7,000 bugs cur currently open in all sorts of states with all sorts of priorities. We fixed a lot, as you can see, but there's still a lot left. So if you're looking for a specific bug, uh, it can be hard to find because there's so many. So we want to try and get that under control. Uh, and as you can see here in the graph, th this is for how long bugs are open right now since they've been opened. Uh, these are all open bugs and every bar that you see is about is, is a year. And as you can see, we're accumulating about a thousand bugs per year that we can't close, you know, before the year is out. So we keep accumulating these bugs. So we really want to see this getting shorter. We want to see a steeper trend line here. 
So how do we smash bugs? So one thing I talked about was, you know, you can fix a bug, but fixing a bug in Drupal core can be quite hard. It takes a lot of time. So there's a lot of different stuff we can do in order to facilitate getting rid of bugs. Um, so what we're going to talk about first is triage. We do a lot of triage. And what do we do during triage? You, you do stuff like uh, updating or adding steps to reproduce. We update summary issues so that reviewing becomes easier for that bug. We look at a specific bug and say, oh, is this actually a bug or, or is this a task or a feature request? So we can keep the focus right on actually uh, hitting the bugs. The next step that we do in triage is maybe updating your priority. And definitely something we do is closing old or outdated issue. We want to see, is this bug still relevant for the, the latest um, current version of Drupal? Um, and we try to look at closing a lot of duplicates. Because in those 7,000 bugs, there's going to be a lot of duplicates. What we do to facilitate this triage is we do group triage sessions in Google Meets. We try to do those every two weeks um, and just go through issues together, look at it, discuss them so we can see a proper way forward for issues that have been stuck for a long time. Uh, we also try to give uh, issue credit for triage because normally you only get credit when something is fixed. We want to try and raise the profile of triage a bit by giving that a little credit as well. We also do a lot of reviewing. Uh, patch reviews, we swap reviews. Uh, we have a nice collection of novice and veteran reviews already. Um, so for novices, there's a lot, lots of things to review. And if you get stuck, we can help you forward. We have veteran reviewers there to supply you with, you know, information that you might need on moving an issue forward or during your review. We also try to set targets. Whenever we're doing triage, we run into something that we feel we can really help out and move forward. We set it as a target, usually for like a two week period, maybe sometimes a little bit longer. So that we can try and focus on a specific issue, see if we can push that forward, hopefully towards a fix, but mostly just to get the ball rolling again, see if we can get a, uh, get some, some traction on the issue. We also try to do a lot of mentoring. Uh, everybody who's ever tried to work on Drupal Core knows that, especially for new contributors, it can be quite hard. The bar for entry is quite high. So we try and lower the bar a bit. By mentoring, it's never going to be super easy, maybe, but we try to make it a little bit easier. Uh, we also focus on writing tests. Since all bugs, in order for them to be fixed, need automated testing. And if you look through the issue queue, you'll see that writing tests is still a bottleneck. Quite a lot of issues need tests. So we want to try and help people get started writing tests. And next to that, also along with the mentoring, we just give you general help on what you need to do when you try and fix core bugs. You know, what's the procedure when you're when you're fixing stuff? Uh, who should you ask if you get stuck? Um, so all sorts of things like that. You, you post a question. If it's related to fixing a core bug, you'll usually get an answer from one of us. So what have we accomplished? Well, there's a nice green column on the right. So everything's going down, which is great, which is, of course, not due to just the bug smash initiative. This is a credit to the entire Drupal community that puts in an amazing amount of effort in trying to reduce the number of bugs in Drupal. Uh, but as you can see, we've touched quite a number of bugs from the initiative. And it's not always let, meant or lead it to fixes. But usually, it's just to push it forward and make sure that it gets the ball rolling again. So why would you contribute to this? Well, um, you can learn a lot of stuff by just going through issues in Drupal core. You touch so many parts of it. So there's a lot to learn just through triage. Um, and we have a huge variety of tasks that I just showed you that you can do that are separate from writing patches. So it's not all about code. It's part partially about code, but not all of it. And along with every other initiative that we talked about today, it just feels good to participate in, in improving Drupal and we're not about adding something new. We're more about, you know, uh, fixing what's already there. But it's always good to participate. So how can you help? Well, obviously, the triage I talked about. We need to do that a lot. But also the reviewing. A lot of reviewing needs to be done. But there's other things to do. I can talk. You need to write fixes to get it in. We need to write tests. 
You can add steps to reproduce. And very importantly, you can help discuss questions uh, in our channel. When somebody has a question that they get stuck, you just help discuss what they get stuck on and try to move things forward. So if you decide to help out, um, if you want to join us, we have the Bug Smash channel on Google Slack. We do uh, meetings every two weeks. Uh, they're on Tuesday at 4 a.m. UTC. Um, and we, of course, have our initiative page. Um, the meetings are organized in threads, uh, and they're very much a 24-hour thing. We're very aware of the all the time zones that are involved. Uh, so when we have the meetings, the, the, the threads are always really active for 24 hours. People keep logging in and waking up. Um, so join in that, even if the, the, the exact time isn't for you, join in somewhere during your day, check in on the discussions we have and, and, and leave a comment. So, uh, so thank you, and I hope to see you online. And a smashing box for, uh, with us. Back to Gower. Thank you, Len. Um, I think the Bug Smash initiative uh, is really timely for Drupal, as you've shown from the data. Uh, as much as we need to work on all of these new shiny things, uh, we need to ensure that all of those, uh, uh, more of those bugs get addressed. So uh, once again, uh, we would like to see, uh, we would hope to see you at the contribution day on Friday. And in the meantime, in the contribution room, if uh, your uh, team of choice is available. So if you've not contributed before, Friday is a good day to start. There's going to be a, a first time contributor workshop. It's going to be mentored contribution where mentors will be available to help you get started. And there's going to be various teams uh, on the contribution virtual meeting room where you can join uh, various teams for uh, decoupled uh, menus for automated updates, box mesh, et cetera, et cetera. So you're really welcome there. And later on, uh, this is a good uh, slide to bookmark or a screenshot or take note of. Um, it will be, uh, of course, included in the recording as well. So these are all the Slack channels on drupal.select.com for the initiatives. And you can follow Drop is Moving on Twitter for further details on future updates. And with this, we are going to your questions now. And I'm moving over here to my live Q&A window. Uh, and there's a lot of questions here. So you can submit your questions in the Q&A window and vote on existing questions. So we can see which ones are more popular. Um, all right. Um, let me start with a uh, front-end question from Peter Ilek. Is there some overlap possible between Claro and Olivero? For example, if Olivero gets dark mode, Claro will get it as well. I know it exists already in Claro based on Jin, so it may be the other way around in this case. Yeah, um, I can speak a little bit to the question. Um, um, th I would defer to the team that's um, running um, Claro. Um, I, I would assume, you know, if Alvaro is looking to get a dark theme, this is something that we can also try to um, replicate on the Claro side as well too, just because, you know, dark theme is definitely a trend <laughs> um, nowadays. Um, so yeah, um, I would encourage you to just um, create a, a ticket and just ping the, the folks that are working on that initiative and just see if this is a feature that everyone wants to have, and maybe this is something that they can um, get into the actual um, Claro um, commit, so. All right, thank you. Uh, so Miro is asking uh, if Len is a core committer or how how is the Box Mesh Initiative working with core committers to get fixes in? So I'm not actually the initiative lead for the Bug Smash Initiative. Uh, Lee Rowland is, uh, but he's in Australia and hopefully asleep right now because it's like 3 a.m. or something like that. <laughs> so he asked me to speak a little about it. Um, uh, so he, he is one of the core committers. Uh, so he's actively involved and the other core committers, are, you know, they can be called in and they check our channel as well. 
All right. Um, so Frederick asks, will the patches workflow be phased out at some point or will it stay next to the fork merge request flow? If so, when is this phase phasing out? I guess. Uh, so we don't have that scheduled right now. Uh, we'll run, probably play it by ear and see, uh, uh, see when people switch over. Uh, and yeah, the real switch off will be when we turn off testing uh, for patches. Uh, and uh, the file attachments will still be there. So you can still attach any file to any issue for screenshots and text files, for examples and such. So yeah, I'll add to that uh, just a little bit, which is that you know, we when we rolled out the new merge request workflow, you may have noticed that it was like right in the, the middle of the alpha beta RC process for 9.1. And we managed to get it out without disrupting a core release, which is a huge milestone. And part of that is because we decided to release it in a phased way in parallel with the existing tools. Because that's let ev lets everybody finish the work they're already doing with patches, um, uh, keep opening them if they don't have time to learn the new process yet. Um, and then switch over when they're able to. So that's uh, just as Neil said, that's kind of what we're doing is we're listening to see how quickly people have gotten up to speed to give people a chance to go to um, mentored contribution days and things like that and learn things. Um, and then we'll make a call from there about what we want to do next. All right, uh, thank you. Um, so Katarina asks, how can we contribute to Seek Editor 5 for Drupal? So that's, uh, there's one issue about Seek Editor 5 for Drupal, and that is uh, drupal.org slash node slash 29666864. So that was part of the slideshow that I've shown. You can uh, look back on the video and you will see uh, on the slides. And there's an issue fork there with uh, Seek Editor 5 included. It's a very early proof of concept that includes uh, all our plugins that we think will be needed for Drupal core, et cetera, and there's a, a needs a lot of work. But that's the issue where uh, these key questions are discussed and then we'll uh, break out to further issues um, as we need them. Um, all right, so there's one more question about Seek Editor that I wanted to address and then I will move on to other questions, so Stefan asks, do you plan to integrate the Seek Editor collaboration feature in Drupal 10? Uh, I believe the Seek Editor collaboration feature it requires a, a third party server to run and communicate with. So that's not possible to host with Drupal core per se. Uh, that would be an option for, for uh, Drupal companies to provide that service, or you probably will be able to sign up with CK Source, the company behind CK Editor. So I think that's uh, definitely part of the motivation of CK Source to help the Drupal community adopt CK Editor 5 is that they, uh, they hope to get more customers on that service from the Drupal community, but that's not a requirement for using CK Editor 5. It's, a, it's an additional extra feature. It's a Google Docs style uh, editing experience. Um, all right, uh, do, 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 do. so next question is, there's lots of talk about Drupal 9 and 10, but it seems that 75% of sites have not even moved to Drupal 8 yet. Uh, are the Drupal community being left behind? Somebody wanna take that or should I take that as well? Uh, I can say okay, a few words, then... Gabor, but I, but I think you should probably the bulk of that one. Um, so I, I assume that number probably came from looking at the update stats on Drupal.org and, and um, uh, what sites are out there and sort of reporting back to D.O. So one thing I would say, right, is Drupal 7 does still have official support into 2022. Um, and there's a lot of people with budgets that were rather drastically affected this past year. So, it, it, you know, it's not the end of the world if there are folks who need more time to make a, a transition um, and who perhaps wanted to see how the Drupal 9 release process shook out to see if it met that promise that it would be an easier upgrade from eight, which it really did. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can keep getting the word out about how well that went, how easy Drupal 10 upgrade will be, 
Um, and maybe as things stabilize, um, we'll start seeing more folks um, make, make the uh, jump. Yeah, I agree that the I think the Drupal 9 release was in part uh, a proof of the pudding to prove that we can that we can do a much easier update uh, for major update that we did before. So if you look at the readiness stats for eight to nine updates for Drupal.org projects, almost half of all the projects are updated um, by now to Drupal 9 compatibility. If you look at the top 1000, uh, almost 90% of the top 1000 projects are Drupal 9 compatible. So I think the uptake of Drupal 9 in terms of the contributed ecosystem from Drupal 8 has been really, um, really uh, great, much faster than uh, Drupal 7 to 8 was. So I think once, uh, once site runners understand that this is a much smoother ride from here onwards, um, it's going to help a lot. And as Tim said, the Drupal 7 support has been extended. So there's no rush right now. Um, there is. So Yao asks, will there be automated updates available for Drupal 8.9 or only for Drupal 9? How will it handle major versions? Yeah, um, I can answer that. So all new features, I think, are only going into Drupal 9. Um, hopefully, like we talked about, the Drupal, the update to Drupal 9 is not so difficult. So, you know, sites can move to 9 to get this feature. Um, it will not support major version updates. So at first, we'll only support patch updates. And so for security um, security updates and then other patch level updates. Um, and then after that, I think, you know, look at miners. Uh, there's a big problem with, um, or a potential problem with database updates. So um, not every patch level update has a database update, but I think probably every minor update would have a database update. So if something goes wrong in that, um, it's really hard to recover from. So that's sort of a hard problem for even providing minor updates. But um, and major updates, you know, you usually have to um, update some. If you have custom code, you have to update it, and you have to definitely update modules as they um, get rid of deprecated APIs. So I think we'll see how patch uh, security level updates goes, and then you know if we can move on to minor, um, major would be would be great, but that's, I think, sort of pretty far off right now. I'll add Thank on. You. I'll add on. Oh, sorry. sorry, just one minor point. Um, uh, Ted mentioned this in uh, your presentation that the first phase of the initiative did include a sort of prototype module in the contrib space um, that can do uh, some kinds of updates. It doesn't do full composer support. It's just core updates. It's not, it's not contrib or anything like that. Um, but that's something that could be useful to you, um, and it is compatible uh, with Drupal 8. Um, but uh, yeah, for the larger question, I would defer to what uh, Ted said and say, you know, I would I would try and upgrade and join join the Drupal 9 train and get all the other features as well. Yeah, but if you're if you're using 8.9 and you're not a composer based site, then the contrib module would definitely be able to help you out. Thank you. Um, so Chris asks, do we have an official timeline for when Drupal will require PHP 8 uh, minimum version? And uh, the answer is Drupal 10. Um, so PHP 7 is going entirely unsupported by the PHP team on November 28, 2022. And we plan to release Drupal 10 in 2022. So PHP 7, all versions of PHP 7 will go unsupported in 2022. Uh, by the PHP team. Uh, Linux distributions may be uh, attempting to backport stuff from PHP 8, but uh, PHP team itself will stop support. Um, so we plan to uh, raise the minimum requirement of PHP to PHP 8 in Drupal 10. It's the PHP team has been upping their, their frequency of releases quite a bit recently. And next up, there are two people asking, Miro and Marcello about using forks with Composer. How does that work? Uh, yeah, we don't have that supported right now. Uh, and I don't think we have any uh, plans to do that in the short term. Uh, yeah, what I would recommend is uh, keeping a 
version of it locally uh, with your deployments. So you have a, you know exactly what you're deploying. You don't want uh, changes from a merge request uh, to go straight to production. Uh, you you want to lock that in at a certain point. All right. Uh, next question. So are you considering other WYSIWYG alternatives when moving from Secretor 4 to 5? Uh, is that the only valid option? Yes, we looked at various other uh, editors. And there is an issue where we uh, had the alternatives and we were picking them out. And what we found is we would need to build uh, migration, uh, migration tooling and we would need to build new plugins uh, system and all of these integration code for whatever editor we would choose um, because they just work differently. And so what we decided is we're going to keep working with the CK editor team because uh, they committed to solving some of these problems that we need to be solved. We have an existing good relationship with the team. Um, and uh, we could still make a CK editor for all available as a contributed project going forward. Uh, for sites that need that uh, to be available. So we did explore various other options and we ended up with choosing Seek Editor 5. Uh, let's see, we have eight minutes left so you can keep submitting your questions. Um, so Hugo asks, in many cases the Drupal 8 9 upgrade only required a single line change but it's taken until this week for our 28 required modules to be ready. Even small changes can be a big hurdle. What sort of changes are required for Drupal 9 to Drupal 10? Um, we don't know exactly what the changes will be. Uh, you've seen in the list that we are still working on a bunch of those changes. Um, and I think as in terms of how we can update contributed modules better, I think there's a lot of discussions, especially in the maintainers uh, initiative to try to form a maintainer's team that could take over a group of projects and make these small changes available. That would be an interesting model for making these one-line changes for projects that would otherwise not be touched uh, for years uh, that, only, that are stable and they work and they only need these small changes uh, for them to be able to work going forward. I think also we had that project update bot that provides the patches, but we did that pretty late in the in the cycle. But now that we know the pattern, we could do it earlier for Drupal 10. So even though it still just provides a patch, we could provide it maybe earlier than we did in the Drupal 8 to 9 cycle. Yep. Uh, Christian asks if the documentation is up to date for forks and issues in general just in case they want to dive right in. Uh, yeah, it's reasonably complete. Uh, don't know of any uh, any inaccuracies. Uh, of course, there can always be more documentation. And uh, right now, we ended up with two versions of the documentation, uh, but they're both uh, pretty good. Uh, so, and yeah, we'll be improving it as as we learn. All right, uh, and finally, I think Jan, uh, Joao asks, should there be a country migration initiative to have more Drupal 7, Drupal 8 migration paths, I guess, for contributed projects to help the migration of those sites? Uh, that would be great. Um, yeah, that would be great. I don't think anything is stopping you to, uh, anything is stopping uh, people interested in that to set that up. The Box Mesh initiative is a great one that that came up from people interested in working on this. There's no reason that to to for initiatives to be mandated from up top. We always uh, include initiatives here, and we have various initiatives that are not at all mandated from up top, but are just based on uh, people's needs and personal desires and interests. And I think this would be really valuable for the community and for people who have this know-how and may have some time available to share their expertise uh, with project maintainers. This would be a great uh, way to pick it up. I think in terms of the DrupalCon format, there's uh, buffs that are ideal for, for kicking these off. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to set up a buff 
and to see if uh, you can gather a set of um, folks that are interested in making this happen. And yeah, I think that's it for our questions. Uh, we are about to uh, to have our time over anyway. So thanks everyone uh, for joining and thanks for the initiative leads for doing an amazing work in leading the initiatives and then presenting uh, this to the whole community. Um, let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> And thanks to you, Gabor, for uh, uh, being the coordinator coordinator for everybody here. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Have fun at DrupalCon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Enjoy DrupalCon.